Hello, um, my name is Stephen Gallagher and I'm going to be talking to you today about the um, the law that has been developed to prevent looting and destruction of art and cultural heritage in armed conflict. Of course, um, I'm speaking to you in March, early March 2022. And of course, we've uh, only a few days ago, we've seen uh, Russian forces invade Ukraine and terrible uh, human tragedy going on there at present. But of course, there are concerns as well for the cultural property uh, that exists within Ukraine. I know that human life is always much more important, but people do get concerned about the destruction of cultural property and about the looting of cultural property as well. So um, there are already people who are talking about this. There are discussions, international uh, protection groups already trying to think of ways and have been thinking of ways for some time of trying to affect some protection for uh, a cultural property of Ukraine. Um, so yeah, Ukraine has of course got some very important uh, uh, cultural property, including buildings, including um, archeological sites and including treasures as well. So people are very worried about this. And this isn't a new issue uh, for Ukraine either, because of course um, there's been an ongoing dispute since the Russians annex, annexed uh, uh, Crimea over um, what's called the, the, the Scythian or the Scythian gold. Uh, these are these gold treasures that have been found all over that sort of Crimea and even further afield region um, of this um, very important peoples, they're very important artworks, uh, which had been held in a number of Crimean museums. And what had happened was shortly before Russia annexed Crimea, uh, these museums had agreed to lend their treasures to a, a museum in the Netherlands. Um, of course, uh, shortly afterwards, when Russia did annex Crimea, uh, an issue arose. Did the museum in the Netherlands return these treasures to the museums in Crimea? The Crimean museums, of course, were saying, yes, this is our property. Uh, but of course, the Ukrainian state was saying, please don't give them back to those museums, which are now subject to Russian control. So uh, there was an issue ongoing about this. Uh, in January of this year, we were very lucky. We had uh, uh, Lawrence Castellane um, uh, come and on, on, online, uh, give us a seminar um, uh, about the, these issues and about the decision of the Netherlands courts, the, the, court, the, uh, the first decision, which was that the, this, this gold should be viewed as Ukrainian state property rather than belonging as private property to those museums. And so it should be returned to the Ukrainian state, of course is now an issue about what is ongoing in Ukraine anyway. So it's not a new issue there. Um, so I thought I'd just talk to you a little bit about the development of laws which have been intended to protect uh, cultural property from looting and destruction during what we now term armed conflict. Um, we can say that the, the law traditionally, particularly sort of ideas of international law um, has always been that if you are, um, yeah, if you are a conqueror, if you are a, a military force which invades another state, well, generally the idea was, you know, if the if the war was was right under uh, principles of Roman law, then uh, well, then it was right to take booty or plunder. Your enemy's property by your conquest became well, really belonging to no one. You could take it. And of course, we see that in Rome itself. Uh, the Romans were a great believer in this principle. So when you go to Rome, it's not surprising that you see many things which have been taken from other states that, uh, that, that the Romans uh, overcome, overcame. Uh, for example, there are lots of Egyptian obelisks and Egyptian uh, sphinxes in Rome, uh, including this one uh, outside the Vatican as well, uh, which of course, Egypt, I don't know if Egypt's answered them back yet, but um, uh, this is, one of the issues. It's long been accepted that if you are the victor, well, to the victor goes the spoils. In fact, <clears throat> Matthew Begdanus has uh, um, uh, noted that really it was a standard and expected form of compensation for armies throughout the, the ancient world that they would loot. They would take loot as their payment, really. And of course, we've also had incidences of state-sponsored looting. Um, uh, we can think of uh, 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 France under Napoleon, uh, and the attempts to form this sort of um, um, museum to glorify the, the conquering French state and to glorify Napoleon as well. We can think of what happened under the Nazis in Germany. And again, the sort of the idea of the Führer Museum there. And more recently, we can think of what happened in Iraq and the idea that there was to be this sort of taking of treasures from Kuwait to form this great museum 
uh, for the state as well. So we've had state-sponsored looting uh, for a number of different reasons as well. And we must remember that looting isn't just by invading armies. Often the, the people who are being invaded will take or go into places that have treasures, will take them because of course they're worried about the future and they want to take something valuable because they've got something to trade or sell in the future. Or if they're gonna run, they want to take something valuable to go with them. So it's always been a problem in armed conflict. Um, we should just clarify some of the terms. Loot, we usually mean spoils or plunder taken by pillaging, as in war, and anything taken by dishonesty. Uh, for stealth, for the example given, is a burglar's loot. So it's, it's the same as theft it's been putting there. Plunder is to rob goods or valuables by open force, as in war, hostile raids, brigandage. Uh, for example, to plunder a town and to take wrongfully, as by robbery or fraud. I think they're quite modern definitions. I think we have to be careful when we look back in time, if we look to the beginning, well, if we look back to, of course, as we said in, in Roman times, the idea was that, that looting was fine. There were some limits, but looting was, was pretty much fine. And I think that's really, the, we should think about this to the end of the 19th century. There were some, there were voices that were raised saying, this is wrong, but there was the general idea that this was what happened in warfare. And I think the analogy in our modern definitions with theft, that's very much a modern thought, a modern construct on this. Um, a, a, an example I would give is we're going to talk very shortly about the, uh, the looting, the sacking of the old summer palace in Beijing uh, by the uh, French and British forces in 1860. And of course, one of the things that was looted uh, was a, a small Pekingese dog, which was taken back to England, apparently, and given to uh, Queen Victoria uh, and gloried in the nickname Looty. Um, so... It definitely didn't seem to have the, the negative connotations that perhaps today we'd be embarrassed by the idea that something was looted. No, it was accepted at the time. Um, and I think we need to remember that when we're using this term today. The origins of the law to do with protecting cultural property from destruction and looting during armed conflict, during warfare, is of course war. Um, as uh, Heraclitus said, War is the father of all and king of all. War is driven this. The, the terrible things that happen in wars, we get the reactions to them. And we've seen uh, a number of developments that have been spurred on in the 19th and 20th century by reactions to war. Um, in our course at CUHK, um, of course, where we talk about our antiquities, cultural heritage and the law, um, we touch on the development of laws to do with various areas of the course which come from warfare, from armed conflict. Uh, for example, in general issues to do with ownership of art and antiquities, um, there are issues that come from, obviously that things have been obtained by looting or perhaps by forced sale during war, uh, during war armed conflict as well, or occupation uh, by, um, by other states. Um, museums, we talk about the issues that museums have to do with how they acquired their collections or where their collections were originally acquired from. Repatriation, return, of um, cultural property, that's that's a big subject today, uh, particularly to do with cultural property obtained during uh, armed conflicts uh, and colonial period. Um, protecting buildings, because of course we've got buildings that were damaged during armed conflicts. We actually got buildings that were created during armed conflicts as well. And there are arguments about whether they should be protected so that we, you know, we have memory of these particular times. Um, issues to do with shipwrecks, of course, because a lot of our shipwrecks that, uh, um, that are uh, around the, uh, the world today, of course, are military vessels um, and vessels that may have been engaged in armed conflicts at the time. Intangible cultural heritage, the newest form of cultural heritage has been identified. So cultural heritage you can't touch. Um, you know, the, the, the ideas, um, our, um, our customs, our beliefs, um, which may have embodiment in things that we can actually see, whether that's in food or in dance or uh, we can hear as music or, or poems or folk stories or whatever else. But intangible cultural heritage, there's always been that issue as well. When we talk about this, with this when I talk with the students about this, the issue there, of course, is um, how during times of armed conflict, there's been an attempt to oppress and to uh, suppress um, intangible cultural heritage because you want to break down people's resolve and you want to dominate them as well. And then the final uh, um, topic where we, we have to spend some time talking about armed conflict is when we talk about what's termed sometimes embarrassing our, our cultural heritage today. We have certain items that we, we would identify as being cultural heritage, something that is important, that has been created by humans, um, which uh, evidences something from our past that should be remembered but it may be negative things. Again, links to 
armed conflicts and the terrible things that happened during armed conflicts as well. So warfare permeates a lot of uh, the topics that we deal with on that course. Um, to think about how it actually started to drive the law, I think we could talk about a, a lot of issues going back even to Roman times where people um, spoke up against the looting or the destruction of cultural property during armed conflict. But um, I think go back to the beginning of the 20th century. And I think we have to start looking at, at France under Napoleon and what went on there. The idea of this sort of, of taking the great treasures from Europe or going further afield or going off to Egypt and taking things from Egypt and bringing them back to France to form this huge collection, this sort of this museum, which would glorify France, which would of course glorify Napoleon as well. Um, of course, when everything went wrong, uh, uh, when Napoleon was finally defeated, we get treaties between the victorious powers. And in them, there are often clauses identifying specific treasures which should be returned to the states they were taken from. There was a general idea, really, that things should be returned, that what Napoleon had done was wrong, even though, of course, there was a long history of looting uh, by all of these powers who were actually involved in finally defeating Napoleon anyway. But no, this had been wrong. So things needed to be given back. And lots of things were returned. Famously, we get the return of the horses of St. Mark to Venice. Uh, here is a painting representing this as well. Question mark, of course, because the horses didn't originally come from Venice. They probably came from uh, Byzantium, Constantinople. They may have come from elsewhere before that as well. But hey, no one was really worried about that. They needed to go back to Venice. OK, they go back to Venice. Um, um, there wasn't a general return, by the way. It was only, of course, to uh, the influential powers, as has often been put forward in, in any of these issues of returns of treasures. Uh, Egypt didn't get its um, treasures back. Uh, but luckily, of course, uh, the French didn't get them anyway because the British saved them and they ended up being protected in, in Britain. So uh, that's a different matter we can talk about at a different time. But we see there in those treaties agreements that things should be returned because it was wrong to take them um, because they are important cultural artifacts and they need to be returned to the states that they've been taken from. Move to the middle of the 19th century, we come to 1860, and again, we get the, the looting of the old summer palace. And this is an ongoing issue today. We still see, of course, uh, well, lots of discussion about this. When these two bronze heads came up for sale in Paris in 2009, two of the 12 bronze zodiac heads that would have been on the zodiac fountain in the old summer palace, um, you know, China, lots of, uh, lots of people speaking up for China and saying, this is outrageous. These things were looted. They were stolen from China. And those are the words that were being used. As I said, at the time, loot was really generally accepted. And by the way, it was said that the, um, the order of the British, the, sorry, the, uh, the commander of the British and French forces was Lord Elgin. Um, of course, he was the descendant of the, the famous Lord Elgin who took the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon marbles. Um, but uh, Lord Elgin had apparently given an order to his troops, the combined force saying, you must not loot, you must not destroy. Well, if so, his troops weren't very obedient because, of course, they, they completely destroyed the old summer palace and we get the looting, wholesale looting. And, of course, those things are still coming up at sales today. They're in important collections. They're in museums around the world. The Fontainebleau Palace uh, uh, collection is, of course, one of the ones that's always identified as a problem. When these heads came up for sale, a, a huge outcry. Um, of course, eventually they did end up back in China, but it was a, it was a, it was a very, yeah, emotive time uh, and raise those issues about returning cultural property. Here's a, a photograph of how the Old Summer Palace looks today. If you go to Beijing, it's worth going, but it is quite a, a sad sight to see. And of course, China, I think, has deliberately left it this way to emphasize um, uh, what actually happened back in 1860. At the time, a lot of people criticized what went on there. Remember, as I said, people have criticized throughout the 19th century, looting, destruction, taking of things. If we I've just mentioned Lord Elgin, you know, the Lord, when, when Lord Elgin took the marbles, famously Byron was very critical. He wrote that very, um, very caustic poem, uh, uh, which is directed at Elgin as well, uh, about how he had sort of desecrated this, um, this heritage site. Um, but yeah, with, uh, with the old summer palace, there were a lot of people outspoken, famously Victor Hugo, um, who, of course, described the British and the French forces when they went in to plunder the old summer palace as two robbers in the night creeping in to steal. So um, 
people did criticize, but we didn't see any uh, legal recourse. There was no legal recourse at the time. We start to see the development of what might be termed real law um, shortly afterwards. And the first vestiges of this, I think, come from the US Civil War. So the US Civil War, we have um, a particular problem for the, the, those in charge of the forces in the US Civil War, particularly in the North. They realize that a lot of the people they have fighting for them are conscripts. They've drawn up these people. They are not regular troops. They are not trained. And there is always a problem that if they're not regular troops trained to obey orders, trained to, to not literally get some sort of crazy bloodlust on them, where they're just going to go and kill everyone, they have no restraint, you're going to get terrible atrocities. Now, there were terrible atrocities on both sides in the US Civil War, but because of this, the North drafted what's called the Lieber Code. So the Lieber Code, really the first, um, I think, important code, which actually uh, um, came up with principles to do with what today we call humanitarian law, humanitarian war. If you can have a humanitarian war, the idea is that you, you have these rules which should um, try to stop some of the worst excesses of war, particularly, of course, and violence against people in death and destruction, particularly of civilians, of course, and built into this was the protection of civilian property and also the identification that certain important institutional property or state property, for example, property belonging to religious institutions, uh, educational facilities, museums, scientific institutions should be, should be inviolable. It should not be taken. It could not be taken. So that was part of the Lieber Code. And again, you know, there had been some terrible things going on. There's some terrible uh, examples of looting and destruction, the burning of Atlanta and other things that went on during the US civil, uh, civil War. But we get that code and the code becomes very influential. Around about the same time, of course, um, we have the development of the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and of course, this is the, uh, uh, because of course, the Henri Dunant, the, uh, the founder of the, uh, uh, of the, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, um, of course, um, is going to see uh, the Emperor Napoleon um, uh, on at Solferino um, and arrives just after the battle has finished and sees the devastation on the battleground. Um, because of this, he is he's very much affected by the whole thing. He's a, he's a businessman, but he's very much affected by the whole sort of idea of the atrocities of war, of what had actually happened. And of course, he founds the Red Cross and because of the Red Cross, before, because of the getting the bringing together of, of nations um, and this idea that there should be, again, some humanitarian principles um, that should be instituted for uh, warfare, including what to do with the wounded, what to do when people were surrendered and everything else. We end up in 1864 with the first Geneva Convention and the Geneva Conventions later on started to develop principles to do with protecting civilians, of course, including their property. And that's where we start to get prohibition again on looting and destruction of what today we call cultural heritage or cultural property. So that's where we first start getting our laws, the Lieber Code, the Geneva Convention, I think, first. But of course, we still have ongoing problems. We have attempts to create further codes uh, uh, during the, uh, the 19th century and some international agreements, but they really founder. Um, we get to the end of the 19th century, 1899, and of course, we've got, we've got the problems in China. Um, and really, we've got the... Um, the uh, colonial nations of the time, um, almost, uh, uh, you know, having a, a battle over who's going to take over in different bits of China. The idea that there was this a scramble for China as there had been a scramble for Africa as well. Uh, this is a famous uh, uh, cartoon from Punch uh, in 1899, which is entitled "Looting the China Shop." And of course, it's appropriate for what we're talking about, because here, of course, the idea is these people each represent one of these nations, um, the colonial powers. Uh, what have we got? Russia, we've got England, I think we've got uh, Germany. I'm not sure if we've got America in there. I think we have got America in there as well, the United States, um, Denmark there at the front. Uh, and of course, um, they're all trying to grab land in China. Um, but of course, the reality of what actually happened at that time was, of course, that people were actually taking things from China as well. We get the um, the eight armies descending on Beijing in 1899, and we get photographs like this that are still shown in the Forbidden City. 
um, which, uh, which show um, Europeans, uh, members of the eight armies, uh, sort of making themselves at home in the palaces and of course things were taken. Uh, I think this is one of the most evocative things that you see in the Forbidden City when you go there. Um, these are the old bronze water butts. Of course, everyone was very frightened of fire in the old Forbidden City. And so you had these water butts that were kept there, um, uh, huge bronze cauldrons, if you like. And if you can see, they, they used to be covered in a thin layer of gold. But apparently when these the troops ran amok through the Forbidden City, they were trying to take anything that was of value. And so the marks you can see, this is what it says on the, on the boards there in, in Beijing. It, this is the marks of the, of the troops using their, um, their bayonets to scrape the gold off the cauldrons. So um, I think that shows you the idea of, of what happened and what was usual during uh, um, armed conflicts and uh, the occupation of facilities. In 1899, by the way, we had our own uh, little issue to do with looting down in Hong Kong as well. Um, so in Hong Kong at that time, the British had taken over the new territories. The convention was in 1898, but we took over in April of 1899. And unfortunately uh, for the British who wanted to take over in the new territories, the, the, the third part of, of Hong Kong, uh, the British took Hong Kong in three tranches, Hong Kong Island, uh, the southern part of the Kowloon Peninsula, and then the rest, what today we refer to as the new territories uh, and the islands of Hong Kong as well. But the new territories was a lot larger. It had um, a more established population, uh, a, a larger, more established population at the time. And the people in the new territories weren't that pleased, it seems, about the British taking over. Um, so of course, when the British did take over, they met some opposition. We ended up with what's termed the Six Day War. There's not a lot uh, said about this. Um, uh, Patrick Hayes wrote a very good book uh, on the Six Day War. I would recommend it if you want the if you want to, to check up on the on this and find out more details about it. And there's more information online about it now as well. But um, at the end of the six days, uh, the British forces having vast superiority in their armaments and everything else, having sort of chased the, uh, the villagers uh, across the, uh, the peninsula, uh, end up in a final battle outside the gates of this particular village. This is one of our ward villages, our, um, fortified villages in the new territories. This is the village of Camtin. And uh, a battle took place not far away from this in which the villagers were defeated. We're not too sure how many villagers died. No British casualties, but it's estimated that between four and maybe 700 villagers actually died. The villagers took their dead away and, and buried them secretly. But these are the estimates that, that Patrick Hayes puts in his book. Um, the British, of course, having defeated the villagers, then move on to the village. And of course, the villagers have the temerity to close their gates to them. So the British blow the gates off and uh, of course, um, take the gates away. So it's, it's a standard procedure. I didn't realize that it had happened throughout um, uh, colonial expansion. That met most of these sort of, if you have a fortified structure, one of the things you would often do is take the gates off it. And the gates are very significant in that way. They become symbolic. The gates were taken to Tai Po on the other side of the peninsula, and there they were um, uh, left on display. And the then governor, Governor Blake, uh, saw them, and it, and it seems he took a liking to them and asked for at least a pair, it may have been two pairs, to be sent back to his estate in Ireland. Uh, now, in the 1920s, the villagers asked the then governor if they could have their gates back. And the story is that they were returned, although the inscriptions on the bronze plaques that you see there and other uh, um, contemporary stories, it doesn't seem sure. It may be the two gates came back. It may be that one gate come back, came back and then another one was actually made to copy it. But, um, but yeah, this is a, an example of, you could say of looting. The gates were taken by the British forces. The governor had them sent back to his estate in Southern Ireland. Here's a photograph of the gates as they appear today. I had to make it two separate photographs to get it in. So there we go, I'm not sure. They're pretty standard form for these um, fortified villages in the new territories. Um, so we, we, 1899, the issues that have gone on in China, the issues that have gone on in, um, in Hong Kong, we have the first Hague Peace Conference and China does send a representative to this. My, my colleague uh, Ryan has recently been uh, given us a, an interesting um, discussion about what happened with some of the influential Chinese characters who went to this particular peace conference. But uh, China had representation 
Um, I'm not sure how influential that representation was, of course. But what we get coming out of that are the regulations concerning the laws and customs of war on land, the Hague regulations, um, which were intended to create a framework to regulate the proper conduct of war, as it says there, and encourage lasting peace. Now, there was an idea that there should be uh, some um, regulations as well to do with the, um, uh, again, to do with the uh, annex to the actual convention. Um, uh, but the, there was a delay in actually establishing these. Why? Because we have the Russian-Japanese War, uh, which ends in 1907, we have the second conference, and that's when we get the Hague Regulations actually being annexed to the convention. Um, it's said that they were really a codification of customary international law uh, on, on warfare. To be honest, they were mostly based upon the Lieber Code, that US uh, Civil War Lieber Code from the, the North in the US Civil War. So what do they do? Important things, they prohibit the pillage of towns and places, even if they're taken by storm. Even if you overcome them, you cannot pillage them. Um, if you are occupying a state, it's expressly forbidden for you to plunder the occupied territory or to confiscate private property. Um, also, if you are besieging or bombarding, then you should take all necessary steps to spare as far as possible buildings dedicated to religion, art, science, or charitable purposes, historic monuments. But there is a caveat provided they are not being used at the time for military purposes. And that really builds in the idea of what's called military necessity. Um, this had been something that had been put forward in, in most of the uh, uh, suggestions for development of protection of humanitarian war and protection of property uh, in the 19th century. The idea that there should always be that exception if it was necessary militarily. So. Um, provided they're not being used at the time for military purposes. And what it also did, interestingly, in the Hague Regulations, this is something that, that comes in later into our later uh, um, uh, conventions as well, is it placed a duty upon the besieged. So the people who are being besieged also have a duty to indicate the presence of any of these important buildings or places by distinctive and visible signs. And they should be telling the, the enemy beforehand, these buildings are important religious, art, scientific or charitable buildings, historic monuments. Um, let's be fair, these buildings are often deliberately targeted, um, but um, the idea was you place a burden on the, on, the, uh, on the invaders, on the attackers, and you place a burden on the defenders as well. And of course, the defenders mustn't use these for military purposes as well, because then they lose their protection. These were the things that, that come into our later conventions as well. Uh, it emphasized that private property couldn't be uh, confiscated and also said that, again, identifying this special property, property of municipalities, institutions dedicated to religion, charity and education, the arts and sciences, um, even though uh, they are state property, they should be treated as private property because private property cannot be confiscated. So that would be it would be wrong to seize, destroy or willfully damage uh, institutions of this character, historic monuments, works of art sciences, this is all forbidden and should be made the subject of legal proceedings. So we already get the identification. You can't destroy this cultural heritage. You cannot loot it as well. And then we get the First World War and everything is forgotten. And um, yes, terrible, terrible things went on. Again, the human cost is such um, that we, it's almost, it feels awkward at times to sort of emphasize how much how many great treasures were lost, how many great buildings, how much uh, heritage was lost as well. But of course, the treasures, the buildings, the heritage, that's important to people as well. That is a loss to people as well. But yeah, the human cost was, was the great tragedy, of course, but this is linked in. Um, after this, the First World War, we get identification of the loss in the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the Treaty of Versailles, of course, is blamed for a number of things. Uh, most importantly, possibly the leading up to the Second World War. Um, but um, it was interesting what was in there. There was a very interesting provision that was put in. Um, Article 238 provided that Germany shall effect restitution in cash of cash taken away, seized or sequestrated. And also restitution of animals, objects of every nature and securities taken away, seized or sequestrated in the cases in which it proves possible to identify them in territory belonging to Germany or uh, allies. So the idea was again, Germany needed to pay, and of course that went through the, the Treaty of Versailles. Germany needed to pay for the destruction and everything it had done. So if it's destroyed things, if it's 
taking things away, well, it should be paying cash for them or it should be returning them if they can be identified. Okay, that's, that's I think we can possibly uh, see that. But what happened, there was some strange effects to this. Article 238 was actually used at one point to require Germany to deliver manuscripts in Cannabula, those, those old books, books, maps, and objects of collections corresponding in number and value to those that have been destroyed from the Library of Louvain. Now, that's not the ones that were taken. This is Germany has to make good by providing other things. And that, that was a very, I think, a very strange idea. Today, I think a lot of people will find that quite a strange uh, way of dealing with things. Um, you know, the library has lost its treasures, so you've got to give up some of your treasures. Um, I'm not sure well, that's really a good way to work. Leading up to the Second World War, we had a number of attempts by the international community represented by the League of Nations at that time to again come together to come up with some new regulations to do with warfare because of what had gone on before. Uh, mostly to do with issues to do with aerial bombardment because of you know the terrible destruction that had been wrought by aeroplanes in the First World War, that new form of combat, uh, other issues to do with the use of certain other forms of technology, particularly types of different types of weapon of, of uh, exploding shells and other things as well. So we have attempts to do this. Some of them are successful, nothing much to do with um, heritage though. And we see, of course, some, some other terrible uh, conflicts going on before we get to the Second World War. We have, of course, the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, where there is, uh, of course, terrible uh, destruction. And we see representation of the destruction of, of people and property, of course, in, in great artworks like uh, Picasso's um, uh, Guernica as well. Uh, then, of course, we have the Japanese occupying China. We have the rape of Nanjing. We have, the again, the terrible things that are done to people and, of course, the the taking of property, the destroying and the taking of property as well. So it, it's ongoing. We get to the Second World War and of course, uh, the destruction rule um, across the world. You know, the emphasis is usually on Europe, but across the world, the terrible destruction. Again, the human cost was, was appalling, but the destruction of property, the theft, the looting, the taking of property as well, all around the world. There were attempts during the Second World War to at least for the um, allied troops uh, to try and educate them and say, you know, you shouldn't take things. But again, we know it went on. And there are still stories today of things being found which were you know, brought back by granddad or great granddad from the war or whatever else. You know, he went into a church, he took a painting, put it in his knapsack. You know, again, the idea of, hey, there's no one here to look after it. I'll look after it. Or, Things have been so bad, I need something for after the war, I need to take something back or whatever else. Uh, again, I'm saving it from, you know, for the allies, uh, uh, the Americans and the British, of course, there was that idea that you're saving it not from, what well, you're saving it from the Russians, uh, which was the idea towards the end of the Second World War. We see the, the states themselves, in particular, of course, the United States and, uh, and, and, uh, and United Kingdom, uh, setting up groups to try and protect cultural heritage and to affect its identification where it had been stolen, uh, looted, subject to forced sale by uh, the Nazis in Europe uh, to recover it with the idea that it would be returned to the states it had been taken from with of course the institution of George Clooney leading the Monuments Men. Uh, well, anyway, the Monuments Men, and we should say of course, by the way, that there were women, of course, that were involved in this as well. But it was um, an interesting idea. It is a unit that has been reestablished in the American army quite recently. Um, again, I think they're having problems recruiting, it says at the moment. I was reading something about this the other day, but an interesting idea and something that's gone on about, again, trying to bring experts in to educate military people in the importance of cultural heritage and in identifying art and antiquities in some ways to, uh, to affect some sort of protection for them as well. So we get attempts to uh, protect um, cultural heritage during uh, the, the, uh, the Second World War, uh, coming up to the end of it. But at the end, of course, there is that recognition of the terrible things that have happened. And we see this at the, the Nuremberg war trials. Um, here we have one of the prosecutors, uh, um, uh, Colonel Robert Story, who said to obtain a full conception of the vastness of this looted program, it will be necessary to envision Europe as a treasure house in which is stored the major portion of the artistic and literary product of 2000 years of Western civilization. It will further be necessary to envision the forcing of this treasure hoard by a horde of vandals bent on systematically removing to the Reich these treasures, which are in a sense the heritage of all of us to keep them there for the enjoyment and enlightenment of Germans alone, unique in history. This art seizure program staggers one's imagination and challenges one's credulity. Um, so again, 
the idea of forming this sort of collection for the Third Reich uh, to show again their dominance. Uh, an idea that, of course, as we said before, Napoleon had had it for his idea of his museum as well, is being emphasized here at Nuremberg. This was a systematic rape of the treasures of Europe. The focus, of course, here being on Europe. And um, we have the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, and we get prosecution for war crimes. And one of the important developments here, of course, was the fact that the, um, the tribunal uh, said that the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which afforded some protection to civilian property and to these institutional properties as well, um, they were um, uh, what we today would call customary international law. They really were, they, they, it didn't matter if you were signed up to these or whatever else, they had become by now, well, they were a codification of international customary law, they said, and they really were now customary international law. So because of this, the tribunal's charter included in it a new war crime, the plunder of public or private property, wanton disruption of cities, towns or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity. That was identified as a war crime. And we get prosecutions for it. The most important, of course, was of Alfred Rosenberg. Um, he had led a very special unit on behalf of Adolf Hitler and had had direct orders from Adolf Hitler, um, which effectively meant that he was to systematically plunder and confiscate the art of Europe. And that's what he'd done. Of course, he was prosecuted for a number of war crimes, but this was one of the distinct charges that he had. He was found guilty of this and some of the other charges as well, and there were some other atrocious things that he did and he was sentenced to death and he was hanged. So we do see some punishment for, at least recognition of punishment for uh, looting during the Second World War. Of course, there are still ongoing issues to do with what was taken during the Second World War. We particularly, of course, we usually emphasize the things that went from Europe. And of course, because of the Jewish, the, the horrific uh, Holocaust, um, you know, there's been emphasis on this. So we still see this in our Hollywood films, for example, this one of the lady in gold. And of course, this was uh, one of those forced sales, which is another issue that arose to do with um, uh, looting uh, in the uh, in the sort of pre-war time as well. You're not actually stealing it as such, you are effecting a sale under, a, under some form of opp oppression and uh, what's called a forced sale, uh, putting things into auctions where only certain people are going to be able to bid and they're going to buy things for very little money. But these are still ongoing issues uh, today. Museums, private collections around the world are still very conscious of the fact that there are items in their collections which, well, need to be, uh, their, their provenance needs to be addressed. In Asia, we, we had our problems as well. There's not as much coverage of what went on in Asia. Um, generally, with the issues to do with the war crimes of Asia, there wasn't as much coverage as there was for Europe. Uh, but for us, we had issues to do with our heritage in Hong Kong. Famously, our statue of Queen Victoria was dismantled, ready to go back to Japan, presumably to be uh, melted down for the bronze. I can't see that the Japanese would have been very keen on a statue of Queen Victoria, but um, I'm sure it would have been for the metals as well. We lost a number of other statues from Statue Square in, in Central as well. And of course, famously, we nearly lost our lions um, outside the HSBC building in Central. So the two lions, Stephen and Stitt, um, today, if you go and look at them, they've got the bronze plaques on them, which explain uh, what happened to them during the Second World War. They've still got bullet and shrapnel wounds marks on them from the Battle of Hong Kong itself um, in uh, December uh, of 1941. Um, but they, um, and, and of course, later on with the, um, the attempts to recover uh, Hong Kong as well. Uh, but at the end of the war, they disappeared. Uh, they'd gone and it was feared they were lost. In fact, it was only, um, it was after the end of the war that luckily apparently an American serviceman was in the dockyards at, uh, at the Kawasaki dockyard in Osaka, lifted up a tarpaulin, saw that one of these bronze lions, mentioned it to someone else who said, hold on, there are some lions missing from outside the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank building in Hong Kong. We'll check. And of course, they were the right ones. They were returned to Hong Kong. Um, so yeah, things were looted. We lost lots of things in Hong Kong. We, we're not sure of what actually went. Um, there are, there were very important collections of paintings and other things, uh, which are now held in some of our galleries in Hong Kong, where there are gaps in the collections because things went missing. Things were hidden before the war. Perhaps things were sold, perhaps things were destroyed, perhaps things are still in collections uh, somewhere 
in the world, maybe in Asia today, that went missing from Hong Kong. After the Second World War, we get the forming of the United Nations. We get the, um, uh, we get, um, uh, again, we get the uh, emphasis on the, um, the Geneva Convention, uh, conventions, and we get the ideas of new principles to protect in those uh, uh, cultural heritage as well. Uh, but important for us is the founding of UNESCO. And in 1954, we get the promulgation of the Convention for the Protection of our Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict. This is the first dedicated uh, convention to the protection of cultural property or cultural heritage as we would term it today in the world. And of course, it, it, it owes its existence to the, 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 the terrible things that happened during the Second World War. It was emphasis, well, the emphasis again was on uh, to protect uh, cultural property in the event of any armed conflict. It placed duties on the attacking state. It placed duties on the defending state as well. It instituted a number of things, including the use of the, of the blue plaques, uh, which are to identify important sites, uh, sites that contain cultural property and that need to be protected. Um, they can be repeated three times to give some form of special protection as well for special sites, uh, the maintaining of registers of sites, the protection of uh, cultural property when it's in convoy, when it's been moved and the personnel with it as well. And again, the idea that, um, that generally cultural property should not be attacked, destroyed, looted. The only time that it could ever be attacked, of course, is well, the military necessity uh, doctrine was included in it. So the 54 convention is there to emphasize that the international community now believes that cultural property needs to be protected when we have an armed conflict. Immediately though, uh, problems with the Hague Convention were identified. The first thing we have to remember is that at the same time that we get the promulgation of the convention in 1954, we also get a first protocol to it as well. A protocol is added. And as soon as you see a protocol, you know there are problems because of course the protocol, well, that's the bit that not everyone could agree to. So the convention, uh, uh, Professor Merriman, who um, of course was the very famous commentator on cultural property and cultural heritage, he said that in all of these conventions, our biggest problem has always been in getting agreement, consensus from the international community. It's a problem in any area to get consensus from the international community. And of course the issue we've got here is um, that the, uh, you end up usually with a convention which represents the lowest common denominator, the lowest thing that everyone will agree to, um, the, the lowest restrictions. So that's really what the 54 convention is. Uh, one issue had been um, duties on states in occupation, uh, the idea that they shouldn't damage, that they shouldn't take uh, property when they're in occupation of another state. Uh, well, that was moved into the first protocol because not everyone would agree to that. And that's where you also see you start to see there are already problems. Uh, then we've had a number of subsequent conflicts, of course, which have shown that there have been problems because we do get destruction of cultural property. We do get looting of cultural property as well. The, um, the inclusion of military necessity has been a good excuse at times uh, for those who have deliberately targeted and destroyed cultural property. And we've seen examples of destruction and looting in the Vietnam War, in Cambodia, the conflict of Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation, the Iran and Iraq war, the first and second Gulf wars, subsequent issues in Afghanistan, uh, of course, more, more recently in Syria and other places as well. So there are problems with the 54 convention. Um, after the 54 convention, we've still got those issues as well. It, it wasn't retroactive in any way, so we didn't deal with the problems of the things that had been looted uh, and stolen during the uh, the Second World War, uh, we got some new international conventions which were meant to aid. They, they were directed to different things, but they could aid with actually perhaps trying to get property back, not the things that had been looted during the Second World War, but if there were subsequent armed conflicts. So we get the 1970 convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultural property, which is to do with states identifying uh, uh, what they would like to identify as their cultural property, and if it in some way is um, uh, exported from their state without permission, without the requisite uh, licensing scheme. The states have to uh, introduce a licensing scheme for the convention. Uh, but if it is, well, then if it ends up in a in a state which is also another member state, then they should be able to institute proceedings to bring that property back as well. We get the 1972 convention concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage. That's the uh, convention which set up the world heritage list. Uh, and again, properties which are on the World Heritage List, sites that are on World Heritage List, there is the idea that they should, again, uh, there should be some protection afforded to them 
under that convention uh, in the event of there being some form of armed conflict as well. Again, it, this is more of an aspirational, aspirational convention than actually any hard law in there. In 1977, we got some additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions that had been instituted in 1949, um, which uh, uh, emphasized again the protection of private property and the idea of these special types of properties to do with, again, uh, what today we'd call cultural heritage. Uh, and then in 1995, we got the UNIDWA uh, Convention on Stolenly or Legally Exported Cultural Objects, which is uh, a, a UNESCO had commissioned UNIDWA to draft this to really deal with the problems of the 1970 convention uh, to do with returning property that has been, as it says there, stolen or illegally exported. Again, that could come in in armed conflict uh, times. But again, we still carry on. We have destruction, we have looting. Um, in the issues to do with the states in the, of the former Yugoslavia, uh, in the terrible wars that went on in those areas, we're not allowed to say war anymore, we have to say armed conflicts that went on in those areas, we saw lots of looting and we saw deliberate targeted destruction of cultural heritage, including, of course, the Mostar Bridge. Um, why? Because this to steal your enemy's treasures, to destroy sites that are important to them, it's a demoralizing effect on them. It, it's, it, again, there's a long history with this. You know, again, the Romans used to do that sort of thing. They would target particular sites. They would destroy uh, particular sites because they wanted to yeah, demoralize their, 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 their enemies. So this is a long history. 1999, um, UNESCO tries to address some of the issues with the 1954 convention because of the issues that have gone in Yugoslavia, in Kuwait, in Iraq, um, there is this idea that the 54 convention hasn't been working. Lots of people have signed up to it, but it's not really effective. So um, they institute some changes. The first is there are problems with the actual institutional framework, how it's being uh, administrated for the convention. So they change some issues to do with that. They instituted what's called the enhanced protection regime, which gives us a new symbol, not just the, the, the blue sign now, we have this new symbol, which is meant to say this is, this, you know, it's not just cultural property. It's not just special cultural property, it's enhanced cultural property. Um, so there is a list available. There aren't many items on this list. Uh, Ukraine uh, has not put anything on the enhanced protection regime list. In fact, um, Ukraine is signed up to the protocol. Russia isn't, but, um, you know, very few states have actually put anything onto the enhanced protection regime yet. Um, there is some new penalty clarifications. One of the criticisms of the 1954 convention was the fact that, of course, um, well, no one had really been prosecuted for anything to do with the uh, with, with breaching any of the provisions in it. Um, we'd had some prosecutions, which again were of people for war crimes, usually linked into in Yugoslavia uh, to uh, to harming individuals, and also issues to do with directly targeting cultural heritage sites but nothing really to do with the 54 convention. It was more to do with, um, with ideas of war crimes uh, outside of the 54 convention. Um, there was also some clarification, which was an important one, was that the, the scope um, of the convention, if you were signed up to the protocol, the second protocol, would extend to both international and non-international armed conflicts. And that was important because, again, you get this idea of we're not just talking of what we might term civil wars, but you don't have an idea that a state might say. We're not invading another state. That's actually always was our land anyway. So there's no international characteristic here. So we don't have to abide by any of the provisions to do with the with the uh, the convention. We still have ongoing problems. Um, still, we've had lots of armed conflicts and we've seen the destruction the targeting deliberately of cultural heritage. We've seen um, the looting of cultural heritage. And of course, we've seen this linked into um, terror as well. The use of armed, uh, sorry, of cultural heritage, um, destruction of it deliberately to, to terrorize. And the looting of um, cultural heritage, cultural property, treasures, antiquities to fund terror as well. That's one of the things that's been uh, alleged at times as well. So it's still ongoing. We've seen as well that the international community, I think as of the issues that happened after 9-11, issues subsequently in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's been that realization that, again, that the international legal framework isn't really effective. So we need to do more to educate peoples. And that's not just 
the peoples in the states where there is this um, uh, heritage, not just the belligerent states as well, um, but, um, but all militaries as well. So now UNESCO offers training to militaries to try and educate them about cultural heritage, about the provisions in the 54 convention, about the protocols, about other international statutes, which may affect um, uh, how war is carried out and how there should be some protection affected for cultural property. There should be no destruction. There should be no looting as well. Um, yeah, and, and this education is intended to prevent these things happening, of course. Um, there have been uh, um, sounds about how we affect recovery, but to be fair, recovery still under the international law, it's not very effective. Um, most recovery of things that have been looted during armed conflicts, even quite recently, well, it either comes about because of domestic legal provisions um, or it comes about because of political negotiations. Usually that's what's happened. Um, penalties, penalising. We've had some developments. The, um, we've had various members of the international community come out with some interesting ideas of how to actually affect penalties against people who have destroyed cultural heritage. Um, again, not using the 54 Convention, thinking of other ways of actually doing this or trying to prevent um, the destruction of cultural heritage in armed conflict situations. So we saw the terrible things that went on in Afghanistan under the Taliban back in uh, 2001. We saw the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha and the international community comes out immediately and you know, says this is a terrible thing. We have a declaration that it's very important cultural heritage, but what really happened? Um, nothing much effectively after that. We saw the issues that happened when the Americans moved into Iraq to actually uh, uh, get rid of uh, uh, Saddam and to uh, um, deal with the uh, issues that were ongoing in Iraq at the time uh, with things like the looting of the Baghdad Museum. And the Americans were heavily criticized for this. They were criticized for other things to do with cultural heritage in Iraq as well, but the Baghdad Museum looting, there was a lot of blame placed on them. Uh, again, I would suggest that there is another side to it. There are interesting books that have been written about this. I mentioned Matthew Bogdanus earlier on, if you read his book um, about it, he gives a, a different side to things as well. But there was criticism at the time that the museum was looted. Of course, it was being looted as well, not just by uh, uh, Saddam's regime, members of Saddam's regime. It wasn't being looted by the American soldiers, it was by everyday folk, even museum employees, employees it was said, who again, well, some it was said were taking things to save them, some were taking it because again, they wanted something valuable because they might have to run away, they might have to, you know, there might be no money coming in, um, they needed something to survive. So that's what went on at the time. But Donald Rumsfeld's comments at the time were heavily criticized. Um, you know, we get this, you know, him saying, well, stuff happens. Again, I think there's got to be a, an understanding of what it, I think he was trying to say was, we're trying to do so many other things. We're trying to affect a, a solution for these problems. Um, sometimes uh, there is, what is it, it's termed collateral damage at times as well. But um, there was a lot of criticism at the time. And the Americans actually, well, they put a lot of resources into trying to put right some of this because I think they realized how bad it looked. Uh, and this idea that the cultural property is very important today, the international community, they're not the only ones that value it. Why do they really value it? Because it seems that lots of people today value cultural property and cultural heritage. Um, we, one of the interesting things was this idea of education for the forces who would be in any of these uh, areas um, uh, where there might be um, the attempt to destroy cultural property or it might accidentally occur, or they might be tempted to take something home as well. Uh, well, education was affected in novel ways. There weren't just the usual sort of classes and lectures or whatever else. Um, the idea of, you know, creating playing cards which give you information as well. Um, well, yeah, not a bad idea, it seems. Let's go back to Russia and Ukraine. If we think about the international legal framework, which is meant to protect cultural property during armed conflict, the 1954 Armed Conflict uh, Convention, the first protocol to it from 54, the 1970 convention, which is really to do with getting property back if it's been illicitly exported, the 1972 World Heritage List Convention, the 1995, uh, um, uh, Unidwa uh, Convention for Stolen uh, uh, Cultural Objects, which of course is linked into the 1970 Convention and the 1999 Second Protocol to the 1954 Convention. Um, 
to be effective between states, they usually have to be partners. They don't always have to be, but they usually have to be partners. Sorry, they have to be parties to this. Uh, here we've got the Russian Foundation in Ukraine. We can see that obviously they are partners to a number of these and they joined at the same time because of course it was at the time when they were actually joined together. So they are members of most of them. The only one we've got a problem with Ukraine is not a member of the 1995 uh, convention, which is, as I said, really to do with, with getting property back. So not so much to do with protecting uh, cultural property during armed conflict. Uh, Ukraine uh, signed up to the second protocol because of course of its experience since the annexation of Crimea. Crimea, Russia is not a party to that. So we've got, we got that uh, international law framework there, but we know it's not very effective. Um, so are there any other ways that perhaps um, there will be some effect of uh, protection of the cultural property in Ukraine at present. Well, as I said, there are many people in Ukraine who are trying to protect their, their cultural heritage now. They've got lots of other things that they've got to worry about, but of course, people do worry about their cultural heritage. So there are people there now who are trying to protect their cultural heritage, whether it's in museums, in other collections, whether it's in, in private hands or whatever else. And things have been moved, of course. We have international institutions to do with museums and other groups uh, who have been, it seems for some time, uh, trying to give advice and trying to help as well there. Um, we also, of course, well, the other thing to think about is one way to try and protect a cultural property during armed conflict is to have an effective mechanism for bringing people to justice afterwards. And as we said, that's always been the problem with the 1954 convention. So one of the things that is different today than, than during some of these, uh, those earlier examples I mentioned to you, even those in the, in the 21st century, is the fact that we have had successful prosecutions now in the International Criminal Court for war crimes purely to do with the um, destruction of cultural and religious heritage. And of course, it's some of the religious sites of things that we're worried about in Ukraine at present. So uh, we had this back in 2016, where the uh, prosecution of Mr. Uh, Ahmed Al Mahdi, um, he was being prosecuted because he had overseen the destruction, as it said there, of a number of buildings, a, a very important shrine, uh, a, a Muslim shrine in Timbuktu, uh, which of course was a, a UNESCO, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So he'd been part of this group, uh, which was linked into Al Qaeda. They had deliberately targeted these uh, these sites uh, for a number of reasons. One, of course, is the the idea of iconoclasm and the idea that you know again the particular religious beliefs they have to do with the idea that there are Muslim saints. Uh, but there was also the idea that it was a world heritage site as well. So it was deliberately targeted to yeah for that purpose of uh, of spreading um, uh, fear, of spreading uh, despair at times amongst your enemy and the international community. Well, he was prosecuted. But he wasn't prosecuted anything to do with, of course, the 1954 convention or anything else. Um, he was charged with a war, a war crime under Article 25 of the Rome Statute, which governs the International Community, uh, Criminal Court, for individual criminal responsibility for crimes under Article 8, um, and was sentenced to nine years in prison. So a substantial term of imprisonment. It does seem like a good deterrent. The only things I would use as the as the sort of the cautions on this is, of course, that uh, Mr. Al Mahdi was handed over by his home state of Mali. Um, so it wasn't as if people had to go out and find him. He was handed over and he pleaded, you know, he had a plea deal. So he said, yes, I'm guilty on the understanding that the, the term would be uh, not too excessive as, uh, as would, might, might have been the case. So it is a success, but we have to be cautious about that as well. But it is a sign that, yes, the, the ICC, the international community in the International Criminal Court will prosecute for these things. And we have had successful prosecutions and people do go to prison for this. And then more recently, we've had an issue going on in um, to do with Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan, uh, which has shown a very novel way of approaching things. So of course, Armenia, there's been this ongoing sort of uh, um, uh, dispute with, uh, with Azerbaijan, um, what is it now, for 20 years or so, um, where as part of this, there's not just the sort of attacks on people and everything else, but again, there are attacks on cultural sites, particularly religious linked sites as well. So we see here um, how certain um, uh, uh, cultural sites have been demolished, desecrated, uh, and there's been a number of churches that have been demolished in, uh, in Armenia as well. Um, 
Armenia alleges a lot of these crimes have taken place or what it describes as crimes have taken place. And um, interestingly, back in September of last year, it took action against Azerbaijan at the International Court of Justice. Um, again, you know, nothing to do with the 54 Convention, nothing to do with any of these. Um, what does it take action under? The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So again, you think, wow, that's, that's an interesting idea. So the allegation was this, cultural desecration is racial discrimination. And because we have this convention which says it should be eliminated, all of it, Azerbaijan, you've breached this and you know, you've got to pay. There is, uh, for some of the uh, destruction of some of the uh, uh, religious buildings, there's an idea that they may have to, well, there may actually be moves to, to order them to rebuild certain things as well. Um, anyway, the International Court of Justice has, has given an order in December of last year um, as part of the emergency measures, uh, which should effectively protect Armenian cultural heritage in the territories that Azerbaijan captured back in 2020. So that's the idea. Could this work? Um, well, uh, both Russia and Ukraine are um, uh, signed up to the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, the idea of whether this would count as racial discrimination, um, I mean, there are ideas that there are different cultures there. I think it's been part of Russia's uh, uh, argument of justification for some of its actions at times. So perhaps there's an idea that if there is any uh, um, desecration, particularly of perhaps religious sites, that could count as some form of racial discrimination. But again, I think it shows the weaknesses of the, um, the international framework in some ways that we are still looking in 2022 to try and find ways to, um, to actually effectively um, hold people to account if they deliberately damage cultural heritage or loot cultural properties during armed conflict. There's a lot of law that's there, but it does, is it that effective? I think it definitely, uh, um, it's very concerning uh, for anyone who's interested in cultural property at present to think about the fact that um, there is very little sort of hard law there that can actually deal with this. Of course, again, in the background of, of the human cost, then there's always that to, to be borne in mind. Anyway, thank you very much. And uh, that was just a sort of a brief run through of uh, some of the developments to do with the law, to do with the protection of cultural property during armed conflict.